Yes. Thank, Thank you. you hey, good afternoon. Wow, there's a lot of people here. <laughs> Hi, my name's Janelle Riley. I am so, so thrilled uh, to be here. I saw this movie a few weeks ago, and I've been talking about it nonstop, so I'm so excited that other people are seeing it so that they understand the references I'm making. Um, but uh, more importantly, it is not just one of the best-reviewed movies of the year. It is one of the best and the funniest. And I'm so thrilled to welcome some of the people who brought this to life. Um, I want to start with the film's director. She is, of course, an actress, writer, and producer. You've seen her in such films as Meadowland and Rush or on Broadway in 1984. Believe it or not, this is her feature directorial debut. Please welcome Olivia Wilde. <laughs> Also joining us is a writer and producer on the film. Um, if you have Netflix, you're probably obsessed with her because she wrote Set It Up. Mm -hmm. um, and a movie in theaters right now that I loved, Isn't It Romantic? Please welcome Katie Silberman. We have a producer on the film and the founder of Gloria Sanchez Productions, which focuses on female voices in comedy. Odds are um, at least one of your favorite movies was produced by them. Please welcome Jessica Elbaum. <laughs> Uh, an actress who um, actually horrified me in American Horror Story. Um, you've also seen her in Scream Queens and a little um, indie series called Star Wars. Please welcome Billy Lord. Uh, next up, we have one of the stars of the film. This is an actress who I have been in love with since Short Term 12. Um, just in the last year, she turned in wonderful performances in the film's Beautiful Boy and The Front Runner. Please welcome Caitlin Dever. <laughs> and finally, a wonderful actress that we all fell in love with, Lady Bird. We all want her to be our best friend. Um, she also made her Broadway debut in Hello, Dolly, and can be seen now in What We Do in the Shadows. Please welcome Beanie Feldstein. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for being here. Congratulations on a fantastic movie. Um, I actually, whenever I have people as accomplished as, as you all are, I like to go back to the beginning and, and ask, what was your first job in this industry, the first time you felt you could call yourself a producer or a writer or an actor? Well, my first job was none of those things. <laughs> uh, I was a casting assistant. You're kidding! For Mally Finn, who was one of the best casting directors in the world, and I, I was very lucky and I learned a lot. So that was my first gig, and it was a, a peak inside the process, of which I knew nothing at the time. I was 18, and it was invaluable, and I recommend it to anyone who wants to learn about this process. Go find a casting director, specifically... Uh, since Mally's no longer with us, our one of our greatest casting directors working did our film, Allison Jones, and sure. she is yeah. extraordinary. So, yeah, that was my first job. But you, I mean, were you already on the path to being an actress? It was sort of uh, on my way to the path, yeah. trying to searching blindly for the path. Um, <laughs> I. I, I wanted some insight into how the business worked because I knew nothing. I came from a family of journalists. I grew up in D.C. and then I went to boarding school in Massachusetts. I just knew nothing. So it was a way for me to learn. And um, luckily, I worked for Mally, who had such high standards for actors mm -hmm. that I learned to always be prepared and professional and uh, to have ideas, which helped me then when I started auditioning. So I started acting kind of straight from her office, wow. so, you know, like left, would leave to go to auditions during lunch. And it was, um, you know, a long road to where we are now, but, but that's where it began. So you would leave Mally Finn's casting office to go to other auditions? Well, she let me read for her. She was doing really big movies that like yeah. they would never have considered me for, except that she is the reason I have my, got my SAG card. You're kidding. Because she let me be, um, they cast me as, I think, like girl, high school girl number seven or something in The Girl Next Door. Um, and it's a scene that is entirely forgettable, but it is uh, the reason I got to say a line, which was like, is it swag? I think was my line, because I was buying <laughs> pot from Timothy Oliphant, which is <laughs> funny, full <laughs> circle here. But I, uh, I, that was I got tapped heart yeah. lead from that, oh, and no so way. she allowed me to have that experience, which was also invaluable because I was essentially background. I understood the very difficult job of being a background mm -hmm. actor, so that when I was in the position to direct them, I understood, you know, yeah. how they should be treated and 
And it was, it was again, a weird full circle example of how every job you have, mm -hmm. no matter how sort of insignificant it feels at the time, is informing you for a later, better job. Absolutely. Katie, for you? My first job was an internship at 20th Century Fox Television during their pilot season. I was in college on the East Coast, and it was very cold, and I wanted to come out for a winter <laughs> somewhere where it was not cold. And it was really, really rewarding. It's kind of an archaic system now. With mm. There isn't the same pilot season where from January to March is when all television shows are being decided what they're going to pick up. My job was that I sat in a closet in building number three on the Fox lot because they wanted to start to digitize their script library. They had a wow. huge closet of scripts of writers that they liked or who had sold scripts so that when they were staffing shows, they could scroll through and say, like, who's written a romantic comedy? Who's written an action movie? And they wanted to have them as digital files, so all day I would send them through a PDF maker in this windowless room. Wow. But it was like film school because I read all day. I literally just read scripts from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And it's how I learned a lot about writing. It's... I wrote down every writer that I liked and kept that list for a long time and then reached out to as many of them as I could when I was in school and a few of them wrote back. You're kidding. Yeah, that's actually how I met. My second job was I was an assistant for Dana Fox, an incredible yeah. writer and producer, and I tracked her down and stalked her after reading a lot of scripts <laughs> that she had written that hadn't been made but they yeah. had in this in this closet. And I reached out to her through her agent and then just kind of pestered her until finally she wrote back and said she couldn't give me a job, but w I could keep her number. And then when she had a television show picked up, she remembered and called wow. me and asked me to be her assistant. That's amazing. Yeah. So you have Dana's number? Yes. Still, that it's 310. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica? Um, my first job actually was in publicity, so shout oh, wow. out to all the publicists. I, I get it. Um, and then I went 15 years ago to work for Will as his assistant and sort of grew with him, and he and Adam McKay started the company 12 years ago, but it wasn't until I went to make um, a film called Bachelorette with Leslie Headland that that was my sort of film boot camp because I did not know what I was doing, and she had never directed, but we sort of figured it out together, and, you know, we, I think, you know, yeah. made a beautiful thing. Um, and that was, that's also the film that inspired me to start Gloria and create opportunities and a place for women to come and, and make sort of their dreams. And when you say Will, you mean Will Ferrell. I mean Will Ferrell, He's, he's Will to you, yeah. <laughs> no, Will. But I really do owe it to Will and Adam for being so supportive. Mm -hmm. You know, this is five years ago, so we did this prior to, you know, the conversation that's happening now, yeah. and I'm just so proud that we've just been keeping our head down and doing the work. Um, yeah. Billy? Well, my story is a little different and weird. <laughs> um, my whole life, I loved acting. I went to Frenchwood's Performing Arts Camp. Shout out, sorry, Beanie. Beanie stage went to Stage Manor. Door. We have a little bit of a rift. Um, but I always wanted to act, but my parents, because they were in the industry, really, really dissuaded me from acting. So I decided I wanted to throw music festivals. So my first real job was working at a place called Insomniac, and then I ended up working at Another Planet, thought I was going to throw music festivals, and then... Uh, J.J. Abrams called and was looking for someone to play Rey in Star Wars. And I was like, this is, I don't think I'm gonna be able to do this. I'm not good enough, I don't know what I'm doing. But I ended up going into the room and reading for it. Obviously didn't get the real part, but I brought in my, read, my professional resume with all my internships and my French honors and all this like <laughs> random stuff that was completely irrelevant to Star Wars. And I read and I, there was some like weird nerf herder line and I said it and he said I was the first person to say it properly without looking at the sides. Um, and then I ended up doing that movie and had such a great time on set. And my mom brought me home at night and said, you know, it's really weird that you're comfortable here. Most people are not comfortable here. This is a weird place to be comfortable. And then I decided that I would try doing it because I had such a great time and then ended up getting Scream Queens. And, um, you know, here I am now. Yeah. And it's hilarious and incredible. And I wish I would have started earlier, but you know, things happen for a reason. Yeah. You're not exactly old now. I mean, it's not like... <laughs> Emotionally, I'm 107. <laughs> um, my first, very first job was a Gogurt commercial. Oh, well, technically, wow. no, technically my very first job that I ever booked was a Mattel Barbie commercial, but it was so non-union that they used my callback audition for the actual commercial. You're kidding. <laughs> yeah. So technically my first job uh, was this Gogurt commercial and I did commercials for 
uh, like about a year until I finally started like doing guest star stuff on on TV. I think the moment that I realized like oh I really really love this role that I'm doing was the role I did on Justified where I was oh, wow. selling the weed to Timothy Oliphant essentially. So it's kind of like <laughs> or he, I was selling the weed and he was trying to stop me. Um, but yeah, I think that's when I really really fell in love with with um, character work mm -hmm. and acting. Timothy has a niche, I'm learning. Yeah. yeah, the weed guy. Oh, yeah, he loves that. <laughs> My first job was when I was 10 years old, I was in a professional production of Annie ah. um, in Anaheim, California. And I was Kate, one of the orphans. And I remember it taught me a really big lesson because I never ever have considered myself a dancer, but somehow dance has come up time and time again <laughs> for me. And the only reason I got the role is because I knew how to tap and they wanted like a little soft shoe section in you never fill a dress without a smile. And they cut like 500 girls from the dance call. And I was like, oh, you know, all these classes I take actually mean something <laughs> and they matter. Um, so I was like this teeny tiny little orphan. And uh, and then I took a long break and did school um, with Billy. Billy and I went to high school together. You're kidding. Yeah, we wow. were great apart. And uh, I really focused on school, much like our characters. I really love school. And then uh, when I was in college, I did a one-liner on Orange is the New Black. And I feel like that was sort of what propelled me into acting, acting for real. Do you remember the one line? Uh, yes, uh, I just put a roofie in my own drink. <laughs> It's you. in like the Amish backstory. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, well, you were all here at the festival with your film Booksmart, which is a very funny, and I mean this in the best way, raunchy movie. Um, but it also has a lot of heart that is not common amongst uh, comedies like this. And I, you know, women aren't always encouraged to explore comedies, but all of you have had very successful careers in it. Can you sort of talk about the moment, um, I guess you sort of knew you were funny or knew this was something you wanted to do and who some of those early influences might have been? Yeah, we'll start down there. Oh, I, I just had one instantly. My third birthday was funny girl themed. No. Um, I was no. a Barbra Streisand fanatic at two and a half. And my mom made costumes and she made me a teeny tiny replica of the full leopard outfit that yeah. Fanny Bryce yeah. wears. So Barbara Streisand would be mine. Please sure. tell me there's photos somewhere. Of course there's photos. Oh, I can send a profile them. picture on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like when I watched The Sixth Sense, I was really young. It was like the first movie my parents the first scary movie my parents let me watch. And I remember I had always just watched Disney Channel and that was all I knew. And I, I watched this movie and I watched Toni Collette um, in that role and I didn't know acting could be so real. She mm -hmm. seemed like my mom. She seemed like my, my real mom. Um, and she was one of my first influences. She was also pretty much the person that made me want to start acting in the first mm -hmm. place. I mean, I always loved performing for people and making people laugh. Um, but she was the one who really taught me like, oh, this is like, this can be really real and you can make this happen. And then I ended up meeting her just recently and working with her, so that was Oh, really you're kidding cool. on what? Yeah, um, on Unbelievable for oh, Netflix. Oh, her new yeah, series, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Wow, that's so cool. Well, my mother was one of the funniest, smartest yeah. humans um, out there, I think, and Basically, like, it would have been really messed up if I wasn't funny. <laughs> I would have been disowned from the family. So I kind of, like, I s started cracking jokes yeah. probably, like, six months. I watched these videos of me, and I'm, like, trying to make her laugh because she made me laugh from the moment I was born. Yeah, it's amazing. So, yeah. Um, I don't know about the funny part. I sort of fell in that working with Will and Adam, but I knew that... Um, I had this sort of producer blood in me at a very young age. I would, if I wanted, you know, candy or soda, because we weren't allowed to have it, I would go on a scavenger hunt in the neighborhood and knock on the door and say, my name's Jessica, I live up the street, and the last thing on my list is a Twix bar, <laughs> and I would get it. And I was like, I think I can do this. Oh There's something wow. to this. Yeah. That's a producer. That's a born producer. <laughs> That's my story. I was actually just thinking about this the other day because I remember a moment when I had a very cool babysitter when I was younger and she was with her very cool friend and I had been just like listening to them wide-eyed all day because I was so obsessed with them and they had referenced something earlier in the day and I remember thinking like, oh, if I reference that, 
right now, I bet that's funny if, that I recall it. And I, but I was in like a flop sweat waiting for the moment to do it. <laughs> it was like entering like a double dutch. I was like, when is it gonna be? When is it gonna be? And then there was a, enough of a pause in the conversation that I could say something like, like David or whatever the callback was. And they <laughs> laughed, they both laughed. And I was like, this is power. Like this is a very powerful feeling that then I continue to try and get all the time. <laughs> Um, gosh, you know, it's really funny. I, my, uh, love, my, my partner is a comedian and one of the funniest people in the world. And I, I'm so lucky that he makes me laugh all the time, but through him, I've learned so much about comedy. And it's interesting because when I was little, I loved comedians, mm -hmm. comedians. I loved, you know, Lucille Ball. That was, she was my dream woman. And I watched her so carefully and I, I said to my mom when I was really young, I want to be her. And then uh, it's interesting because I identified with those comedians, didn't become one, but I wanted to be her. And then I wanted to be on SNL when I was like 10. And I, and I said it to my mom, I want to be on Saturday Night Live. And she didn't laugh the way that I think that, you know, a lot of parents would. She said, okay, you have to study at Second City. You need to study uh, Nichols and May. You need to study all the great improvisers. You need to learn the craft, and then you will audition after years of studying for Lorne Michaels, and then you'll have your chance. And if that's how you, what you want to do, these are the steps. And I was like, oh my, <laughs> that sounds like a <laughs> lot of work. Um, but it's interesting, because then it all came full circle with, you know, then being with Jason as he was on SNL mm -hmm. and really learning about how incredible that craft is. And I think comedians are so brilliant and often so undervalued for the complexity mm -hmm. of the work that they do, um, it's this high wire act that I find really incredible because, you know, while I love to laugh and I surround myself with incredibly funny people, it's something that I never thought of for myself. Yeah. I, I've been in comedies and I really, really love them, but I, I just am in awe of the art of comedy and especially when it's essential to our society. And I, I want to quote Carrie Fisher because this is a quote that has gotten me through a lot of stuff and forgive me if I butcher it, you can correct it, but my, lef my life better be funny because if it's not funny, it's just true and that's unacceptable. Exactly. <laughs> and that has gotten me through a lot of stuff and I, mm -hmm. I think it we does. all have to laugh. <laughs> Um, I could be wrong, but you have yet to host Saturday Night Live. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> Why don't you get in there? Oh, uh, well, you know, that, that would be extraordinary. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing art form. It's yeah. just so extraordinary to, that they do it. And that they've never compromised. Mm -hmm. You know, they do the same thing that they were doing in 1979, yeah. whenever, 75, whenever they premiered, 75. And I think, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of an essential part of our society. We need parody. We need satire. So you'd be up for it if asked? Yeah, oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I realize I just did that thing my mom does, which is you should be on Saturday Night Live. Do okay, that. Okay, mom, sure, I'll go do that now. <laughs> I was it's not into it, but now that you mention it, I'll go do it. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just that easy. You make yeah, a call. Well, yeah, you probably could make a call. <laughs> so I want to start at the beginning with Booksmart, um, I think with Jessica, because I believe that this yep. first came to you. Um, and what was it about, I mean, you must see a lot of scripts at Gloria Sanchez. And I don't know if everyone's familiar with what Gloria Sanchez does. It's, it's such a great idea if you kind of want to uh, tell people about it. Yeah, again, like I started it just to, I, it's a little selfish because I wanted to work with women and I wanted to work with friends and Olivia and I started as friends and have now been collaborating. But um, it was, you know, a mix of selfish because I went off and I made that movie Bachelorette and worked with all these talented women and thought I want to do more of this. And then also I knew that there was sort of a hole. Um, and so, you know, it's created to be a home, you know, a go-to place for women to come create and, and kind of fulfill their dreams. So that's my mission. Um, and Booksmart, Annapurna actually brought it to me. Um, so thanks to Annapurna, they brought me in and, and said, we need a comedy producer and we want to put this together in the right way. And that's sort of how it began. And, and Olivia and I had actually been working on something else together that we were both producing, um, a series for Comedy Central. And just through getting to know Olivia, it's like, I keep joking, when you know, you know, sort of similar to when you meet mm -hmm. your your person, I, I, there was no reason other than you meet her and you know that she's a born director and, and that's it, it, it that's it. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm so glad that I was right. Um, but truly that, it was just an instinct. And then we came together and we found Katie and, you know, Caitlin actually, 
back it up, was even on board before I was. You're so Ka me. Caitlin was OG. sort of the OG. Um, so if you want to talk about it. I mean, yeah, this, I, I read it. I can't remember like how long ago it was, but um, when I first read it, I thought, oh, I, 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 don't, I won't be able to do this. I, they're not going to give it to me. <laughs> and I, because it was so awesome, and I've never been given an opportunity like that before. Um, and then Jess came on, and then it seemed like it was gonna happen. I'm like, oh, am I am I still am I still a part of this? Do you guys still want me? And they did, and I was so happy. Um, and then I think that's when Liv came on, and I was like, I think Katie mentioned this before when she read when you first read the script, oh, yeah. you fully chucked your laptop out the window. When you get an email that's like Annapurna and Gloria Sanchez and Olivia Wilde are making a movie. You just like toss whatever you're reading away. It's you too just exciting. You toss yourself anywhere, and then you chase after it and finish the logistical part of the email. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, and then it was just like an amazing experience yeah. from that point on. I mean. Um, then Olivia and I started, you know, having meetings together and talking about like her vision. She had so many ideas. I mean, there was literally nothing stopping her from making Booksmart the mm -hmm. best it could be because you know it started off as a, an incredible idea, and when Katie and Olivia came on, they just made it the best it can be. And I even remember talking to Jess about that too, and and the music ideas, and then the casting, and Allison Jones. I mean, it was just like an insane process that I got to be a part of from, from the early stages, which I have never been a part of like that before, so. And Olivia, you've directed some great music videos and some very acclaimed short films. Were you looking just for the right project to make your directorial debut? Was it inevitable? <laughs> yeah, if there's anything I learned from even directing videos is I couldn't be a part of something I really didn't believe in. Like after, um, uh, well I should say my first music video we shot on iPhone, so there's no excuse. Everyone can direct if you have a phone. Uh, and then uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers gave me the opportunity to direct one of their videos. And people really liked it. And suddenly I got all these offers to direct other bands. But I, and people were like, that's great, all these huge, huge bands. And I would listen to the song and be like, I, I can't do it. I don't love the song. I don't love the song. I can't give it my heart. And I thought, oh, no. I won't be able to do things unless they're really, really true to me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to wait for a feature that feels that way. And what if it never comes? And I want to do it so badly, but ah, I, I, I couldn't quite get over the hump of the blank page. I had been working on my own script for a while, wasn't quite getting it there. And I had been expressing all this to Jess and you know, sharing stuff with her and telling her you know, how much fun I was having with the process of discovering myself as a director. And she said, you should pitch on Booksmart. And I read it. And I was so thrilled that she trusted me with that task. Um, she has impeccable taste, and I was really, really honored. And I was also excited because I thought, I can pitch on this and like not get it, but just have said I pitched on a feature. And uh, I, one of my best friends is Reed Morano, and she had just made this leap from cinematography to directing, which I got to produce and be a part of. So I saw up close what it takes, and she inspired me so much to go for it. Um, but then, you know, that personalization that allowed it to have my heart in the way that I knew I would need happened when Katie came on and we started really developing it to this place where it was suddenly so autobiographical in a way. Really? It's really fascinating. Like I, I say to all the directors out there, even if it's not your piece, you can make it your piece. In fact, I think you have to in order for it to be good. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes you can't do that on your own. So welcome the collaboration. Um, and that's and that's what led to all this. I was curious how, if any at all, autobiographical it is. I mean, I, I assume you've never been turned into a Barbie doll, but um, or maybe Why? I should. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, how many people here have you seen the movie yet? I should. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Wow. Right. Yeah, that's great. And every, how many people tried to get in? to see it and couldn't. Ah, there oh, there's another screening today. Oh, you're kidding. What time? I don't know what time. 5.45. 5.45. They know. They know. OK. In this building. In this building. So I'll try, not to, I'll try not to be too spoilery, but uh, you're in for such a treat. Um, but I mean, was it sort of based on female friendships or you know, experiences? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think it was the most fun part of developing it to me was being able to dig into what made our best female friendships feel specific. And the Beanie talked about this a little earlier today, and I've been thinking about it a lot, that you know that your best friend is multidimensional because they're open enough to show you all of their dimensions. And I think women are 
showing the world not as many dimensions, mm -hmm. usually, or women are not as seen in as many dimensions. And so to make a story about our best friends and the way that they've inspired us and encouraged us because they see us, but we see them as like, our favorite person to party with and a doctor or very smart and very funny or you know all the different myriad of ways that people can surprise you once you really get to know yeah. them that was besides the barbies i feel like the most autobiographical part. we also we stuck in a lot of like personal experiences yes. of like just high yeah. school trauma and like <laughs> there's a bunch of our personal stories yes. in there it was very therapeutic <laughs> My yellow turtleneck is in the film is because Olivia wore a yellow turtleneck really? when she got to Los Angeles. I didn't understand the weather, and I came from the East Coast, and I always wore like I wore like brown corduroy suits and turtlenecks. I, I dressed a lot like like Johnny Lee Hooker. In fact, I'm sort of still in that place. Johnny Lee Hooker could not pull this off. I think he could. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, for the act, oh, so no, guys. I was just saying, I also think it's autobiographical in the sense that when we realized that everyone has a first best friend that you kind of have to break up with to yeah. move on to the next phase of your life, that inspired a lot of it as well. That that friendship can be so meaningful and powerful, and it's going to change really significantly when you're not seeing them every day for eight hours a day, and acknowledging that that's inevitable but doesn't take away mm -hmm. from what it meant to you while it was happening. With also, I feel like is autobiographical to a lot of people who worked on the movie because we all had someone like that. Oh, sure. Um, for the actors, I'm curious because I feel like it's very rare where you get a script that has a great female character, and this has not one, not two, not three. I can count at least five amazing female characters in this. When you started reading it, I mean, what were your initial thoughts? <laughs> I had actually read it before, like an early, early, early version of it, um, and then I'm, I remember when I met Olivia, we were at a Tony Award event, and it was very intimidating. And I see this glowing orb of beauty come at me. And she's like, Beanie. And I'm like, pretty sure I'm the only Beanie, but she couldn't possibly be speaking to me. And she, we started talking, and I was like, how the hell does Olivia Wilde know who I am? And then like a week later, I got a, a call that sh she wanted to speak with me about Booksmart. And I was like, Olivia has Booksmart? That's so incredible. So when I knew it was that script that I knew was sort of being, growing and changing and becoming what it eventually was, and then Olivia and we sat down, we were both between shows on Broadway, it was all very glamorous. Um, <laughs> and we sat in Times Square in a little like a restaurant and we talked about, and I remember Liv, she was like, this story is, the, the stakes of high school are so high mm -hmm. like she was like this is war like for them this is war and like molly thinks she's the general and she's not <laughs> like but she thinks she is and like the stakes of that and then the the stakes of their friendship and we just talked so much about our friendship i was just i was so moved i just think the fact that this film centers on not one but two smart capable funny wonderful women is really really something special. I've never seen two of those women on screen together loving each other, supporting yeah. one another. And then you bring in Gigi, Billy's character, yeah. and Molly Gordon's character, AAA, and Diana Silver's character, Hope, and on and on and on, and all of these different types of women who the audience projects one thing onto them, and my mm -hmm. character, Molly, projects her judgments onto them, and then the audience and Molly come to this realization that they were wrong all along, and yeah. so kind of ripping open those archetypes. Because when you have two people who are the smart girl, then the smart girl ceases to exist. They're just women that are smart. Yeah. When you have two beautiful women that are hot and they're smart and they're all these other things, then the hot girl ceases to exist, the crazy girl ceases to exist. So <laughs> that's what I love so much about the film was it used the archetypes in order to break them down. It, it really, that's only possible when you have really, really great actors, of course, who personalize and make choices and are specific. Um, I will say something that's really exciting about everybody on this panel is that this was, <laughs> these actresses were on my original lookbook. It's You're really kidding. rare, I think, that a director puts their dream lookbook together wow. of casting and then actually gets that cast. And I still haven't shown them that original document, but I will now. <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, because it was sort of creepy because I was like subtly stalking them for yeah. a year before. Um, uh, and I was so excited about the fact, I mean, Jess and I talked about Beanie as Molly from, from the very, very beginning, and we just knew. Because another thing that I think is different about 
the comedy for women in this movie is they're not funny because they are a mess. Mm -hmm. It's not that we're laughing because they're just so, they're just so messy. And it's like hilarious to see how messy they are. They're funny because of their intensity and because of what they're saying and doing. And it's, it's a different kind of comedy for women that I, I think is really exciting, mm -hmm. but it's because they, they can pull that off. And I'm curious, are you guys, you know, there's been a lot of talk, especially in the last year, about finding better roles for women, creating better roles for women. Women can be funny, believe it or not. Women can open a movie. Um, do you think you're seeing an improvement overall? I mean, I think we still have a ways to go, but some of the scripts you're looking at, are, are you seeing changes? Yes, I want to be optimistic. Yes. I think because companies like Gloria Sanchez are being born, you know, they were ahead of the game, but I think there is a, a sort of a decision being made that we have to make change at the executive level. Mm -hmm. It's not just about saying like, well, I hope people write more female stories. It's like, no, let's start a division that focuses on locating that content and supporting those filmmakers. Megan Ellison started Annapurna with the desire to champion filmmakers who weren't, wouldn't get their films made at other studios. This is not a film that would have been made at another studio in the way that we made it. Um, so it's about people with that kind of power empowering others. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's something that I, I take very seriously. It was my job on this set to hire people that I really wanted to give that chance to. Um, our production designer, Katie Byron, is someone who's an incredible rising star in the production designing world. And it was really exciting to be a part of her success. And so I, I think that there is movement towards change, and I think people are making commitments now and understanding that it does have to happen within the kind of infrastructure of the business itself. And I'm curious, I don't know, um, I, I, don't, I don't mean to be simplistic, but I know it was a very female-heavy set, not just in front of, but behind the cameras. Did that feel different? Was it a different atmosphere? I will never forget this moment as long as I live. <laughs> Caitlin and I were in the car with our incredible stunt coordinator, <laughs> who sat down, to drive the car, she was dressed up as Jared, Skyler's character, oh, that's and she was pulling the car really fast out of the spot when it sort of takes off. Um, when is it? After when the cheap when he picks us up from Amy's house, right? And we sit in the car, and I'm like, "How was your day?" And she was like, "I just had my eighth grandchild." What? And I was like. This is the most revolutionary thing I've ever seen on a film set. This is a woman with eight grandchildren who is stunt coordinating a film. And I was like, imagine her grandkids on the yard. Like, what did your grandma do today? Oh, she's this in assisted living. My grandma ripped out of a car, she flipped it over, and then like, it's the most insane thing I've ever heard. And so it, was, it wasn't just the actors and, the, and all of us sitting up here. Look at these gals. Yeah. Um, but it was uh, so many positions on a set that you don't often see. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was, it was that one that really like right. stuck in my heart. And it was even after set, also I'll just mention like in the post-production process, being on a sound mix stage with a female sound mixer, female post supervisor, female editor, like it was throughout the whole, every element of it, it was really extraordinary. Mm -hmm. I think also kind of remarkable to all of us was that the male crew members we had were so empowering to the women. Yeah. You know, they we Jason McCormick, our cinematographer, mm -hmm. he really enjoyed being able to work on a set working for women and telling this story. Um, and I, his crew also incredibly excited to be there and passionate. And I never once felt um, infantilized or that I was, you know, anyone was being patronizing. I felt lifted up. And I think the role of male allies was really illustrated on this set. Mm -hmm. And it was exciting to be able to uh, kind of create our little ecosystem that we hope will be representative of what the future of Hollywood and the world will look yeah. like. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I thought oh, no, you wanted to say something. Um, <laughs> and again, for the actors, you guys, all of you have such incredible chemistry. Um, Billy's character kind of starts, we all know this girl. You know, she's the party girl <laughs> that we think one thing about, but then she is so wise and insightful. Um, was that chemistry pretty instantaneous? It looks like you guys are having a great time. Immediately, I fell in love with this love at first sight, love at first sight for all of these humans. We, I don't know how it happened. I mean, it's obviously because of Olivia and Katie, <laughs> but we just all immediately fell in love with each other and had such a great time and felt so comfortable and so supported. And I've never had an experience like it. And I hope it happens more now. Yeah. 
Can I suggest sequel? Oh, yeah, sure. Book, book I'm smarter. available. Uh, book smarter. <laughs> Done. Great. Let's shoot. I, I, I think a thing we've also been talking about, and Liv has mentioned several times, but you can't really fake chemistry. And I think it was this the set that Olivia created and the vibe she created on set that made everyone get along and everyone just loved each other and it was so collaborative. Um, but for me, Beanie, we I when I when we met, we fell in love. I I, I remember the day we met, and it was it was an extraordinary big day. hugs, big hugs all <laughs> around. But we also lived together. I heard um, this. Was that by her decree or? We were we it was were like sitting a symbiotic at lunch. Thing. It was like kind of a thing that either was it we we mentioned it and Olivia was like oh yeah and we we're like oh wait can we is that allowed can we do that and she made it happen and so yeah we we lived together for for pre production uh, throughout the film and until we I wrap. Think my most proud moment of this film was that I was Caitlin's first roommate. <laughs> really? I know, my very first roommate. Wow. Never had a roommate before. Yeah. Who was the messy one? Oh me. <laughs> I also like. I remember I overslept once, and I would have definitely missed the the van to set if if Beanie hadn't come and knocked on my door. Um, pup. Yeah, we, we call, call each other pup, pup or puppy, and I was like pup. I was so it was gentle asleep. at first, and then I was like pup. We gotta go. Go. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are gonna take some questions from the audience. I think there's a microphone in the center if you want to line up. Um, before we do that, this you sort of address this um, about you know hiring crew, but um, what can all of us do or what can people out there in the industry do to sort of empower women to have these opportunities to tell these stories or just be an ally on a set? Um, well, first and foremost, you, you can't hire based on resume. You know, we have to sort of break out of the meritocracy. You can't, you have to uh, hire people based on creative ideas and passion because the paradigm has been set, dominated by white men and it is not um, easy to break out of it if you continue to pull from the pool of experience because the experience is there only because uh, that is what has existed. You have to reach beyond that. So one thing everybody can choose to do when they're hiring is to go beyond the resume. Um, I think that's a really important first step. Mm -hmm. I think uh, encouraging women to be in a part of a lot of different processes as well. Like you note how there are many different numbers in terms of female producers and writers versus in the camera department, in the in the grip department, anything. Uh, we had such a wonderful production designer, but uh, you know, I think three women have won an Academy Award for project, production design, so that might not be right, but it's a low number. And so I think looking out on a set and seeing women in all the different departments was a really extraordinary thing about this set and something I'm going to look to try and copy everywhere else I work because that's, then you want a, a diverse set of opinions and perspectives on every aspect of a movie that way. And so that is something I really hope to, to continue to, to get to see. Um, I would just say it's, you know, look around, it's possible. And I think, you know, it's great to talk about it, but we just need to do it. Like, just do it like we did. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, not, not to simplify it, but I think there's a lot of talk and it's all about coming together and, and doing it. <laughs> Actions speak louder than words. Yeah. I've also just noticed a change and even, I feel like it, it, it can, p people can be competitive and I think we have to just like let go of that and sort of just like be welcome. And again, like not judging from a resume mm -hmm. too, I think. Yeah, I think just champ championing other women's work. Um, Katie was speaking today about when Bridesmaids came out, uh, she got an email from her other writer friends that said, we have to show up opening weekend because this is important. The numbers are important. So I find any moment, we've had such a privilege of this, you know, this weekend to talk about other female stories that we've loved. And that's been so meaningful to me because I think the more that women get seen and their incredible work gets notice the more they can continue to make it mm -hmm. i i felt so lucky to be a part of ladybird but it also set my standards so high yeah. uh, i was like <laughs> i did ladybird and hello dolly and i feel like what will i ever do and then olivia came with booksmart and i was like oh my god something that means this much to me and i think when female stories are celebrated and heard that's incredible but it's not only celebrating your own but the other, the ones other people are doing. Tweet about it. Tell your friends. Mm -hmm. Go buy the tickets, and then they will continue to get to create more work. Mm -hmm. 
and as I've mentioned, this this comedy can be very it's raunchy with heart. Um, is there anything you wouldn't do in the name of comedy? Because I'm wondering if there were like so many things made it into this movie that I'm like, oh my god, I wonder what was left on the cutting room floor. I mean, there was nothing we shot that I wouldn't do. You know, we were really thoughtful about what we even decided to put on the page. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't think there's ever a reason to be degrading. I don't think it ever yeah. leads to anything really funny. Um, everything we had on the cutting room floor was gold, <laughs> and it hurt me physically every time we had to take something out because these people all turned in like hours, days of an amazing movie. Um, but I, I don't think there's any reason to degrade mm -hmm. anyone. No. Any of the actresses want to weigh in? I just felt like with Liv and Katie and Jess, we just knew anything we would do was yeah. like safe and no fear in comedy. <laughs> no fear. No fear. Um, well, let's start with uh, there's a question uh, at the microphone. I think that's that's the only one, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Hi. Congratulations. Saw it last night. Yay. Loved it. Obviously. <laughs> um, yeah. Just so exciting. So I kind of have two questions ish. So for Olivia uh, first, um, congratulations. Thank you. And um, what was the difference for you, you know, coming back to South by with this movie versus like when you were here with Drinking Buddies, mm -hmm. which I also love. And then for Beanie, what was it like to play one of the titular roles? <laughs> titular <laughs> role. <laughs> uh, well, the difference for me between Drinking Buddies and, and Booksmart was that Drinking Buddies, you know, I got to be a producer on that film and part of that creative effort, if for anyone who doesn't know Joe Swanberg's work, he's part of the you know, so-called mumblecore. They don't use scripts. And it's really empowering for actors because entirely improvised performances gives you so much creative license. And I felt that I was actually being taken seriously as a writer because I got to craft scenes. So seeing that at South By and seeing it work made me have the confidence to take myself seriously as a storyteller. So it linked to Booksmart. I think, you know, the difference between being an actor and a director, though, and as you premiere a, a film, is like, gosh, as an, as an actor, there is this sort of um, margin of error where you're like, if it's bad, and I say this because I've been in some really bad things, you can blame it on the director. Mm. And because <laughs> you should, because if it's bad, it's, it's mm -hmm. the director's fault. Um, but if it's, but, but, but being a director is just a, just a scary thing. So last night was significant in a lot of ways because I was very, very vulnerable in a way that I've never been before. Um, and I, I am so, eternally grateful to all these people for all the work they put into the film. I feel like I'm holding their work in my heart and presenting it to the world. And it's, uh, it's a vulnerable thing, but it's also a huge honor. <laughs> um, I think my, uh, my favorite part of being a more prominent role <laughs> in, in this film was working with Caitlin. I think, oh God, I'm gonna start to cry now? Will Do I get it. through one interview without <laughs> crying? It will not happen. You've ruined me. Um, I I can't even talk about short term twelve or I'll lose it. But I I, mean, I think she's just extraordinary. And any time, you know, I am very used to uh, playing my whole life, not just even in my professional career, but like in community theater, I played the supporting role. I grew up in musicals, and if you looked like me and sounded like me, you were the character. You were never at the center of of the story. So. This was a really, really, really big deal for me, but the better part of it was that I got to do it with her and with Liv and with this you know, incredible group of women, but really the two of us were on this journey. And whenever I was like, I can't believe I'm in every day, I'm in every scene, like what's happening here? I could just look at Caitlin and I felt, I felt comfortable. Yeah. It is extraordinary between Lady Bird and Booksmart, like you singularly have made people value friendship yes. more. Yes. And it's really special. It really matters to me, really so that's matters. really nice. <laughs> I said after Lady Bird, like, everyone wants to be your best friend. You're the best friend everyone wants. And then you went and did it again. I had to create a whole movie just to become her friend. It was just <laughs> now my she's way. Best smart. Friend. Smart. I will be anyone's friend. It would be my honor. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, hi. Um, so this question is for Katie. Uh, uh, since uh, this screenplay was penned by you and three different people and... Um, and your previous film, uh, uh, Isn't It Romantic, which is one of my personal favorite movies of the year besides Booksmart, Thanks. which I saw yeah. last night. I wanted yeah. to know, how is uh, your writing process uh, being so collaborative with uh, a group of people and, and, then one, and one screenplay? Mm. Yeah, well, they were actually kind of different processes. That 
uh, Isn't It Romantic is a script that I wrote with a writing partner, with Dana Fox, that woman who was my second job, was working for her, um, on a, another, a previous iteration of a screenplay uh, by Aaron Cardillo, another really talented writer. The, Booksmart was a script that I had been aware of for a long time in previous iterations by Emily and Sarah and by Susanna Fogel. And uh, they're very talented writers and had kind of different interpretations of this same great idea of two really smart best friends who go on an adventure together. And so when I uh, was lucky enough to come on and Jess and Olivia were attached and they had, and Caitlin was attached and Olivia brought so many ideas and such a specific vision of the way she would tell that story. And so uh, we got to kind of evolve this same great nugget of an idea of what we would wanna watch two best friends do on this adventure and infuse it with more autobiographical things specific to us and kind of be able to evolve it to the version of that movie we would tell today in 2019 because a lot of times when movies are are rewritten, it's fun to track the evolution of both the business and the world as like what you're allowed to do with women or with comedy or, or, or you know the ways that stories are going. So that, it was a very collaborative process when I came on with the director and with the producers and with the actors to kind of uh, take another step towards what the 2019 version of the story of two best friends would look like. Thank you. Next. Hi, first of all, congratulations on the film. Oh, my name is Becky, by the way. Um, I waited four hours in line to see it, and I loved it. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> the part that resonated me with the most about the film and that I love the most was the portrayal of a certain character's sexuality. I won't say who because I don't want to spoil, uh, spoil it for everyone, but... Mm -hmm. Um, but the part I love most about that was just how healthy and realistic it was portrayed. And for someone who identifies as gay and who has seen a bunch of like lesbian and gay uh, uh, roles on screen, I really have to applaud you guys on, you guys like nailed it, like making it so like realistic for girls that age and how healthy it was. And so I guess my question is like, how did I guess like, how did you do it? Because I know, like, director Sebastian Lilo of the film Disobedience, starring two lesbian, um, yes. it's about two lesbian Jewish women. He not only consulted uh, people in the Jewish community and their life in the Orthodox, but he also consulted, like, lesbians on their experience in order to get, um, to get their input mm -hmm. in order to make the film more realistic. So did you guys kind of draw on that, like, something similar? Or, Olivia, did you, like, draw on your experience from your character on the OC? And oh, also, yeah. <laughs> And also, oh, that's right. Uh, how did it like? What did it mean for you guys to be able to portray this kind of character that's so underrepresented? Mm. Rep underrepresented. Obviously. I do love how matter-of-factly the sexuality of some of these characters are handled. Yeah, I love that too, and it was something that we really were interested in to like treat it as a non-issue, because honestly, that's what I feel. I'm from from that the young generation right now. I think they're so evolved. I think you're so evolved. I think there's this this movement to just just acceptance and, and fluidity. And I think it will lead to a much better world. I'm really inspired by it. And we wanted the film to accurately represent this generation. It, and so it came from the generation itself. We were answering to the reality that they're, they've created. Yeah. And I think too, in terms of in our lives and trying to infuse it with how our real friendships are, our friends who identify as queer, it's like the fifth thing we would mention about them. If not the 15th, it's never the first thing that you mention about them in real life. And I think it was exciting to be able to make a movie like that where it was one of many qualities, who knows down the line when it would be mentioned, but it obviously infuses your life, but it's not the defining quality of your life when you're with your best friend and there's so many other things going on. And there's also humor about it. I love that um, Caitlin's character, her parents think you guys are lovers. You know, and, and you Will Forte. Kudrow Forte. and Will Forte. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I completely echo your sentiment. I think it was really meaningful for me to watch the film. Um, my partner is a woman, and I feel like when I saw Caitlin, oh God, I just gave it away. <laughs> um, uh, well, it's not a big, it's not, it's a not the important part of it. It's, it's not. not a spoiler. Really, yeah. Um, um, he's a but uh, there's a there's a, a love scene between two girls, and they're fumbling with their sneakers, and they can't get their jeans off, and all of those moments they like make me tear up because yeah. representation is really important. And also, Caitlin's character is not the only gay character in the film, and so there you go. Like, what an what an incredible thing that our film is doing, and. I think uh, if I could have seen that film, this our film earlier, I think my I maybe would have found myself a bit sooner. Yeah. Next. All right, 
Thank you. I, I look forward to waiting another four hours in line for you. No, next, <laughs> next time you better be right at the front. Hi, this question is a little similar to a previous one, but hopefully a little different. Um, it's for Katie. Um, Set It Up is my favorite film like of all time. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering, obviously that was on the blacklist. Um, what's it like kind of from the business side, but also the creative side, going from that to being brought in on, the, on this film where a script had already been written? Yes, that was on the blacklist. And I think it's, it, it depends entirely kind of who you're collaborating with and what, if you're coming onto an existing uh, piece of property that is for some reason going in a different direction, it depends totally on who you're collaborating with. So I got to come in with a director who knew exactly what kind of movie she was gonna make and I just needed to kind of like hop on this train and hope to get to do it with her because it was so inspiring and exciting. The deck that she talked about that I saw, so like when I was thinking of these characters, I had these three photos on that deck to look towards, which wow. was so cool. Um, and so it's, uh, the, the people that you're involved with in that collaboration will then determine kind of how you approach it. Sometimes it's, it's little things throughout and sometimes it's taking kind of the core idea that people really loved about something and saying, what's the next evolution of the way that we can tell that story? So as long as you're working with someone who, who inspires you and is and leading you down the right direction, it's, it's, it can be just as fun, if not more fun, because mm -hmm. you have a partner. Uh, we only have five minutes left, so let's do a speed round Thank on you. these last three. <laughs> Um, so this is more of a general question, but when you guys were first starting out in these introductory roles in the industry, um, what is some advice that you would look back and give yourself uh, mm. if you could? Uh, create your own content. I should have done it a lot earlier. Mm -hmm. It's possible. We were talking about the phones before and how you can do it. It doesn't matter what department you want to be in. Um, just make your own content and put it out there. You have to start doing. You can't wait for permission to start doing the art. You just got to do it. Yeah, I would say take note of the people you admire, both the way they behave and the work that they do, and reach out to as many of them as possible. Reach out to 50 of them in the hopes that one will respond, and then if none of them respond, reach out to another 50. <laughs> um, I would just say, similar to life, treat people the way you want to be treated, with mm. respect and, and such. Say yes, just go for it, try everything. Um, I don't know. That's good. No, that's great. Yeah. That's all I've got, speed round. <laughs> I, I feel like I, I would just say, you know, stand up for, for what you believe in and what you want, um, and don't be afraid to say no. Um, that too. Yeah. <laughs> say yes and no. It was a speed round, I, I didn't mean it. <laughs> I always say, like, I have, like, a, a note on my phone of, like, all the inspirational things that people I've worked with have said to me. Um, wow. I have so many of Olivia and Katie in this whole group, so I feel like when you're inspired by something, just jot it down, and then you can have it with you. You should really do that. I need to start. Ditto. That. Seriously. <laughs> the first one I'll jot down. <laughs> Next. Saw the film last night. Really loved it. Thank you for being here. Um, you talked about, uh, Olivia, earlier, uh, generational teen comedies. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I think of the 90s, I think of Days and Confused, 2000, super bad. For today, I'm going to think about book smart. Aww. But yeah. what you. stood out to me was you know, how really beautifully shot some of the scenes are, like the, the pool scene and even dropping mm -hmm. around at the airport and the way the sun. Like, did you guys storyboard it that way, or did it kind of? Uh, no, we didn't storyboard that. That um, I had an incredible cinematographer, Jason McCormick, and I asked him to come on board because I had seen his work and knew that he was he had worked for Harry Savitas. He was incredibly thoughtful, and he really um, had an emotional connection to the script. When I met several DPs, he was the one who talked about the characters and the emotional journeys. And I was like, well, this is what I want. I want a collaborator. Uh, you are my eyes. I want you, I want to be able to kind of express emotions and you tell me how I can see that. So for the pool, I said, I want to feel like she's flying. I, I, and for those of you who haven't seen it, that sounds really weird, but you'll get it. Um, I want to feel like she's flying. And it, that was a perfect combination of like an incredible operator, an incredible actress who was fearlessly swimming underwater with her eyes open uh, and acting somehow underwater. Yeah. But there were... Um, you know, moments where I had the kind of emotional intention of what I wanted it to look like, but it took the collaboration with the cinematographer and the production designer to say like, how can we get this to feel and look this way? For the airport scene, I'll quickly say, that was something that was um, 
we had about 25 seconds to shoot it because the sun was going down and you can control a lot or you think you can control a lot on a film set, you cannot control the sun. <laughs> and it was plummeting, I swear, faster than it usually does. And um, it, it, we had this second to get this moment and I asked these actresses to bring the thunder very, very quickly and they did and it was, inc it was, a, it was outstanding, mm -hmm. but it was also the collaborative effort in the entire camera department. We had grips running across the street. We had everybody in the department just working together to make it happen. And all I did was explain the emotional intention and everybody did what they do best to make that happen. Um, and then it's a lot of luck too because you can yeah. set it all up and it might not work. So we we're also very lucky. Uh, the super bad comparison has obviously been made before, and I think it's a really, it's a good comparison. Yeah. You know, it's a great movie. We should be so lucky. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and uh, Beanie, you know someone from Super Bad. Um. <laughs> Who? You know Michael Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> Bill Hader. She's Bill Hader. Yes, I was going to say Bill. Seth. Um, has Has your brother seen the movie yet? Not yet. Oh my gosh. When you did you when you told him that you were making it, did you did you say there might be some parallels here? No, um, yes and no. I think, but well, my favorite thing about Superbad is that it values f male exactly. friendship. That exactly. was the revolution of that film. The jokes are incredible, but the revolution of that film is the boop moment. It's that boop. tender moment between, those, I haven't seen it since I was like 12 years old, but I remember that moment. Those boys, they love each other so much, and that, if anything, that is what I think yeah. is taken in our film, just celebrating friendship it, within a comedy. Um, it's so I remember seeing the boop in the trailer and being like, what? Yeah. Boys that, expressing that's love? That's the best part of the film. I mean, the jokes are incredible, yeah. but like that tenderness. Yeah. If I may say, this movie is actually, can we call them boop moments? This movie is actually yeah. full of boop moments. We have moments. a lot of boops. Yeah. <laughs> We're so lucky that there's those boops. I have to say, I, I talked to Jonah about a year oh, before yeah? we started, and I, I saw him at an event, and I was like, Jonah, I'm in love with your sister. I need her to be in my first movie, and I'm obsessed with her. He said, I, too, am obsessed with her, and she is a genius, and I think you'd be so lucky to have her as the star of your film, and it was, it's an amazing love and support they have between them. You know what is amazing when I first met Beanie, I was like, I'm in love with your brother. And she's like, not more than me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the kind of family they are. I have a terrible brother, so I'm like so jealous of people. No, he's he's awful. Oh. So, so I'm like so jealous of people who have healthy yeah. sibling relationships. Yeah. Amazing. All right, no pressure. Last question. Okay. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm directing a film next month, and uh, it took, took about five years to get it made. Um, it's a short film, though, so not a feature. But I want to talk more about getting films funded mm, and yes. access to getting our stories told, especially as a woman uh, filmmaker, but specifically a woman, black uh, woman filmmaker. Because um, we don't talk about it. We talk about like getting our films made, like create anything, but we don't talk about actually how to get it funded and yes. get it made. Mm. Yes. Well, I could speak, I mean, Jess, you, you should speak to this too, but yeah. I'll just say like, you know, um, there's so many grants out there for filmmakers. And I think that it's, I, I think, you know, finding those opportunities is, is something that is really helpful. I um, benefited from a program that doesn't exist anymore. It was Glamour Magazine used to do this thing called oh, yeah. Gra Glamour Real Moments, yeah. where they gave a budget to female filmmakers to make a short film. And it was extraordinary. Uh, they should definitely bring that back. But there's other things like that. So like finding all the programs, all the grants, and then of course, identifying studios that are actually, and producers who are actually willing to take a risk and fund material. Um, but Jess should speak to this, because what she does so well. well I mean, thankfully, there are places like the Annapurnas of the world that take chances and, and you know, are homes for people like you. But, I, you know, Olivia's right. There are places, there are grants, there's, you know, crowdfunding, there's all of that. But it is identifying people like me that are looking for people like you. Um, and we're out there, you know, and, and want your voice and want to work to help make your dreams come true. So it's, it's a little bit of both. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before we go, I want to remind everyone this movie comes out in May. May 24th. May 24th. Please spread the word. What are your hashtags? And we were talking about social media. Are you yeah. on social media? I know Beanie, Caitlin, oh, Billy. Yeah. Was, everybody we're here? Have, yeah, we're, aren't, we're just such millennials. <laughs> All of us. <laughs> no. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, Booksmart, and we have the hashtag Bookstart. Booksmart Music. <laughs> Whoa. Booksmart Movie, and the Twitter handle Booksmart. 
And um, I think we're figuring out the rest of our messaging. But yeah. for now, we're just book smart. So please spread the word. Um, also, I don't know if this is just you being an overachiever or coincidence, um, but the movie premiered last night on your birthday. Yes. That was that really extraordinary. I mean, how lucky am I? This has been a, a truly transformative weekend, and I'm really grateful to everyone who came out and spent my birthday with me last night at the best, na best <laughs> night of my life. Um, it's, it's been incredible. Our dream was to premiere here, yeah. and it was because of the audiences here and the kind of energy around this festival that, by the way, is featuring more female filmmakers than ever, and that's Janet Pearson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so as we depart, I hope you don't mind. Um, actually, Beanie's the one who can sing. You're the Broadway star. Um, they can, can all just, sing. We can yeah. just sing uh, Happy Birthday to Olivia on no. the way out. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Olivia. Opening May 24th. Thank you so much. That's so Thank sweet. Thank you guys Thank so you. much. Thank you.